Okie doke. I think we have most of the people we are expecting. TJ went inside. He'll have to catch up with us later. Can people thumbs up if they can hear me? Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Oh. Well, I am Jespin West from the Conservation Commission uh, of Randolph. Thanks very much. There's a couple of us who are also here uh, in the chat. We've got Emily, we've got Jenny, we've got Rachel, we've got TJ. I think I saw Chandler here. Um, this was a presentation that was going to be live, but instead it's going to be like this. And I really appreciate uh, Jim's flexibility and being willing to work with us for this. I'm just going to do a quick introduction. We're going to get started. If you have questions, we'll have time at the end for questions, but also there's the chat function, which you can type questions in and Emily is going to be moderating and we'll um, can relay them to Jim either sort of during the talk or afterwards. So thanks very much for having for being here. And uh, if you've got any other questions about the Randolph Conservation Commission, we've got information about us on the uh, Town of Randolph website. So just a little bit of introduction for Jim and then I'll let him uh, get going. Jim grew up in Tennessee with uh, roots in Southern and Northern Appalachians. His mom's parents raised most of the vegetables they ate, loved reviving old ways to sustain the land and made every visit a celebration of the good earth as he helped process produce. His dad's father was a landscape architect whose eye for design with nature seemed to stem from the wonders he loved finding in wild lands like the Vermont Highlands near where he and Jim's grandmother grew up. At an early age, Jim took to the woods and natural history and his dad's 1930s vintage bird guides. Discoveries of pileated woodpecker nest trees and Kentucky warblers led to studies in biology at Southwestern at Memphis, graduate research in plant ecology at the University of Georgia and University of North Carolina. Jim's passion is to understand the structure and function of plant communities and their associated fauna. At Green Mountain College, he and other faculty developed programs in environmental studies and biology. He and his students documented regional flora, vegetation, history, ice storm effects, plant succession in clay plain and floodplain forests, and restorative methods. As part of their campus flora project, Jim and his students developed native species, gardens, and campus policies based on conservation biology, reducing landscapes, ecological footprint, and improving bird habitats on campus. This year, Jim's major goal is to conserve the Green Mountain College Herbarium. He's annotating, repairing, and filling gaps in the data for 4,000 plus specimens that'll be donated to UVM's Pringle Herbarium, preserving important documentation of the flora in Southwestern Vermont. So I'm gonna take our poster off the screen, give the floor to Jim, Hopefully this will be seamless and amazing. And thank you very much. And thank you, Jim, for doing this presentation for us. Thank you, thank you uh, very much. That was very kind, Jessamine. And uh, hi, everybody. This is very, <laughs> this is truly distant from you, but um, I, I tell you, it's been exciting that we went ahead and did this uh, virtually, even though we couldn't do it live. Um, and what I want to emphasize, yeah, is, is something Jessman mentioned is if you have questions, things you want to talk about, uh, either if it seems like it fits within the talk, go ahead and enter and put it in the chat. Um, or it, we'll have time at the end too to talk about these things. Um, one thing uh, I wanted to mention, well, let me, uh, let me go right into the, I've got some slides that will accompany this. And so um, let me, um, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, so uh, again, thank you for that introduction. Um, I just wanted to mention that, uh, yeah, it was a pretty early age that I went into plant ecology or got interested in plant ecology because of a love of birds. And uh, it seemed like as I was getting really in into bird watching that I, I kept needing to know, well, what plants are those that they're um, living in, hiding in? Um, the, the information I'd given Jessamine mentioned Kentucky warblers. I remember coming home from school every day because I was hearing an unfamiliar song uh, down in the woods and I would 
I kept looking for this and it was very secretive bird and finally got a glimpse of this warbler. But those plants kept um, making themselves obviously part of, part of that bird's habitat, part of that bird's life. That's the interest there. Um, before I get started, I wanted to mention Rutland County Audubon. Um, it, uh, Kathleen Guinness, who is the current uh, chair or the, the president of Rutland County, sent me these images. Um, and in, in a way, we've had this neat collaboration to line me up to do this talk through Rutland Audubon. And I wanted to mention uh, some things ab about them. If you're ever looking for um, a club to, to be involved with, it's a pretty active Audubon over there. Uh, one of the things I'll highlight that you see here as you glance through things, they ha hey, have a fairly unique uh, set of data, this 15 years of, of um, data from the West Rutland Marsh where they monitor that area monthly and they have 15 straight years of this data and uh, wonderful programs and that sort of thing. So I, I would encourage you if you're ever over in Rutland or if you're near enough to be active, they have members from all over the region, probably as far away as, as Randolph. Uh, now, this is, this is the slide that's supposed to make you chuckle. Uh, this, this is um, sort of like uh, movie credits that uh, go on and on and on and on at the end of a great movie when everyone's leaving. So I'm putting it here at the beginning. I just wanted to, you can look at this later if you are perhaps interested, but I just wanted to thank, uh, of course, the Randolph Conservation Commission, Rutland Audubon, uh, Glenn, Gwen Causer up at Audubon, Vermont, uh, who uh, collaborated a little bit, and, um, and then a whole slew of organizations and individuals, some of whom I'll mention during the talk. Um, but you see the, the, let's see, the fifth item there, the Global Strategy for Plant Conservation from Botanic Gardens Conservation International. It was the first good model I found for how a college might design its, uh, work on its designed landscape to be more sustainable, to have a, a smaller ecological footprint. And indeed, a lot of those aspects have to do with creating bird habitat. Um, and I won't go through all of these here, but uh, I just had great fun uh, digging back into my old notes and putting every student who was sort of closely involved with, with the Campus Flora project. I did wanna mention this very last item, Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology. Um, I'm, I don't do much photography myself. And so what I've done is when I have done, included bird photographs, I'm heavily using uh, photographs from All About Birds, the Macaulay Library. And I should also mention uh, Go Botany, which is an online version of Flora Nova Anglii, which has great images of plants. And so uh, some of those are used in the talk as well. Okay, let's get started with uh, this interesting topic. So what I want you to do is imagine a habitat, any habitat, and think about what is it about plants that attracts birds. I've got a couple of examples here. Um, you see a longleaf pine savanna there on the left and the famous red cockaded woodpecker associated with those older longleaf pines. They depend on pines that are old enough to have heart rot uh, into which they can dig their nest cavities. Um, and then we'll go into some things, a whole slew of things that are related to the, this relationship between the woodpeckers, not these particular, we won't deal with the woodpeckers much, but uh, plants and their habitat have many ecological aspects, as you know. Something closer to home might be a cattail marsh, uh, uh, just like you'd see at West Rutland Marsh, you see on the right. And, and you're, you're very familiar with 
the fact that some birds are pretty, pretty specific to certain habitats, like the Virginia rail you see there, the marsh wren and the bittern. Uh, some birds are a little more generalists or they, they have broader uh, ranges of tolerance to conditions like red-winged blackbirds. You'll sometimes see nesting in very, like ditches along roads, as long as the, there's a little bit of young um, growth in a, in, a, in a ditch, for example. So um, let's, here's the, here are the topics I'd like to cover. And as I was putting this together, I realized um, the real heart of this talk is this first topic. I've listed here plant ecology, plant-bird interactions, uh, and then the evolution of plant-bird interactions and plant selections before a discussion. Um, so the real heart of the talk is this background on plant ecology. And the reason is, um, it, I just wanna provide something maybe a little different than, than you've had on, on this topic of bird, uh, plants for birds. Um, and really, uh, it comes from my perspective that it's enormously useful to know um, as much as possible or have an understanding as much as possible of all these factors that do influence plants and birds and, their, and how their interactions function uh, to then understand, well, much better, how are you going to manage your plants or what plants would you select? So um, the bulk of the talk will be in this plant ecology background section. And then I'll have a brief, but, but very, um, I think, uh, nice, nicely su summary kind of sections on plant bird interactions and their evolution and plant selections. And they'll, you'll see they'll build on that background. So, and hopefully there will be plenty of time for for discussion and questions. Okay, so under plant ecology, I guess my overall question might be what are plants doing? And we'll cover just, just a quick review of how plants change the resource environment. Uh, and I should say, how, how are they depending on that environment? But the organic matter, oxygen, carbon, soil, nutrients, water, and temperature will be topics we'll cover quite briefly. And then uh, getting more specific to plant-bird interactions, a uh, very important topic of how plants create habitat, how, how they interact with other plants and how they interact with animals. So this is a review in some ways of things you've known and I promise I won't dwell on this slide very long, but plants do photosynthesis. Yay, <laughs> um, it supports, um, all animal life, as you know, and I'm going to and list, look at the lower hand box, lower right hand box. You'll see functions of that organic matter. Well, it produces the food that everything else depends on, creates habitat, recycles nutrients, and these plants sequester carbon, and they even modify uh, uh, water. I'm going to skip through that and go back up here. Um, if you look on a broad scale and you start thinking about plants and birds, um, yes, globally, we can think about uh, broad vegetation types. And um, again, detail here is not important. We're gonna do these briefly, but just to note that net primary production, that's what NPP is. Um, this is in grams per meter squared per year. Um, varies tremendously. So for example, the highest you see there is that top one, the tropical rainforest, um, and the, the deserts down at the bottom with, with um, uh, only 70 grams per meter squared per year. But then we have characteristics that are uh, maybe surprising that something like a tropical rainforest and Maybe uh, the, ton, the, the taiga, the cold, moist, cold uh, boreal forest, has very similar resonance times. In other words, if 
you look at the total biomass and you divide it by the net primary production, you get um, an average rev residence time uh, very similar in those cases. Um, these are just things to keep in mind. Uh, we're, we obviously know that plants make oxygen. And I just mention it because there are some very important ecological factors about plants that we don't worry about on a local scale because the atmosphere is highly mixed. Um, and so we, we have a pool of oxygen there that serves the whole world as long as plants are doing their job. And um, I do want to mention that plants have been a, a force in geologic history uh, to uh, really change the atmosphere uh, as well. Soil is the same way. Uh, you see the graph on the, the middle right um, where it's showing uh, relative amounts of CO2 in the atmosphere uh, back, even back 600 million years. But what uh, a lot of times maybe folks don't realize is how much CO2 there was, a tremendous amount of CO2 in the atmosphere before there were vascular plants. So vascular plants uh, came along in about the late Devonian and really reduced the CO2 dramatically in the atmosphere um, and doing things that roots do. They get down in the soil, process a lot of nutrients, and um, then also sequester lots of carbon. And I'll be even more brief here. We know that plants help cycle nutrients. They're taking up nutrients. They're preventing the, the erosion of those things. They affect water cycles. Um, this is a kind of a cool study in the graph um, showing that um, in, a, in a watershed where the uh, trees were cleared, there was an increase in the mean flow of, or in the, in the flow of stream water. Um, and this has everything to do with the fact that trees uh, uh, engage in a lot of uptake of water. They take a lot of water out of the soil. They put a lot of water into the air through transpiration. And if you cut those trees, then you have really reduced the amount of, of water that is is going up into the air and increasing the amount that goes into streams. And uh, some of the history of flooding in Vermont uh, is characterized by some tremendous early large floods, um, probably because of the tremendous amount of land clearing in the 1800s. Um, and in the early 1900s, we still had uh, much less forest cover uh, than we have today. And finally, on these uh, sort of physical factors, plants change the temperature uh, uh, quite a bit. Uh, th these are on this graph on the right, you see um, that the little green bars show um, temperature fluctuations in stream water uh, in the shade, the green bars being less extreme. Uh, versus an open pool where there's lots of sun. How's it, uh, the, the goal here right now is to just provide this background, this foundation to be thinking about, well, how is this going to affect birds? Um, and uh, we'll do more specific thinking about that here in a minute. Um, yeah, so let's just, I'll skip the one on the, on the left there. Um, but so we've done a little bit of looking quickly at these uh, bullet points. And I wanna move now into how plants create habitat. And you think, well, okay, let's look at a plant, just one plant and it has some interesting plant morphology. That looks like what you'd see in a botany course. Well, let's put it all together though and imagine a habitat. And this is, um, this is from work that's become rather famous, MacArthur, MacArthur study from 1961. If you uh, now imagine full-grown trees, and pardon their, their typos in their figure there, uh, the black warbler is a black-throated blue warbler. The myrtle warbler, sorry about the spelling there too, but they found that 
there were these very interesting, um, uh, you might call it habitat partitioning going on between these different species of warbler. And it gave, it was a study attempting to see, well, how can these warblers coexist? One way they coexist is to spend time feeding or specializing in feeding in different parts of those trees. Uh, they found that the Cape May warblers were uh, feeding in the very tops of these trees. Uh, black dirty green and black dirty blue, pretty similar in the upper reaches outsides of those trees, the myrtle warblers lower and bay, bay breasted kind of up in the middle part of the tree, uh, but including a lot of the uh, central branches. So you have this um, habitat partitioning, and in fact, that's part of their niche, niche part partitioning um, as those plants create habitat. Now this slide we need to spend a little bit of time on because, uh, and, and also I, I pulled some pictures from my own photographs. Um, and what I'd like you to do is think about habitats familiar to yourself. Um, uh, and it could be your backyard, it could be the woods in back of your, your, your home, uh, it could be any natural area or otherwise. But um, think about vegetation structure, because it turns out that MacArthur and MacArthur were onto something extremely important. Foresters know about this. Um, there, when you're looking at multiple use of forest and civil culture for multiple use, um, there are, there are many prescriptions that address um, vegetation structure and, re and recognize its importance to birds. Uh, just to run through some of the things that say an ecology, a plant ecologist might describe uh, in terms of vegetation structure, uh, you'd certainly look at how tall is the canopy, how open is it? Uh, it could be anything from 95% closure where it's a very closed canopy to more of a woodland. Um, picture the uh, longleaf pine savanna we saw earlier. It might be uh, have only 20% closure. It's mostly open sky. Uh, composition refers to, well, what species are there? And um, in, in a lot of forest prescriptions, there's uh, a recognition that it's useful to have softwoods or the, the evergreens. Here's some hemlocks on the left. Here's some uh, deciduous trees on the right. But um, th this particular stand of, you see a lot of uh, hemlock and white pine in the foreground and there were deciduous trees in the background. This was uh, taken while a Blackburnian warbler was singing up in the canopy. They, they, they actually prefer, uh, or seem to be associated with um, deciduous forest that has a good component, significant component of, of evergreens in it. So that composition and then snags, are there dead trees? The dead trees are part of that forest and uh, in fact, ecologically quite important. And we'd also look at understory layers. We might describe tall understory trees or short understory trees. We might look at the shrub layer, uh, similar aspects how tall is it? What's the cover? What's the composition? And then the ground layer uh, is simply the vegetation near the ground. It could be even low shrubs, but um, often it's herbaceous. Sometimes there's very little there, as you see under the hemlocks. Um, and, uh, but, but similarly, we want to look at uh, the cover, how, what percent of that ground is covered and, and what the species composition is. Um, many birds are associated with certain structures of vegetation and many birds are associated with certain kinds of litter. The litter being the dead organic matter on the surface and whether they're surface water, surface soil exposed, um, woody debris and what kind of woody debris there is. Um, and then we're also interested in that the parent material and soil and drainage. The same time, in looking at these structures, you want to keep in mind the dynamics. That is, what are the past disturbances? What's the disturbance history? And by disturbance, I simply mean 
uh, fire and wind throw and flood. Uh, this is a, on the right here is a floodplain forest uh, along the Pulteney River, uh, which experiences annual flooding right near the river um, almost every year. And then uh, less frequently, it'll, it'll flood a larger floodplain. Uh, very dynamic that way. And then the succession is the slower regrowth following those disturbances. But of course, what you see in the vegetation, it may be nicely explained by parent material and soil and drainage, but uh, more often than not, we have a disturbance history and a successional track that is also affecting what we see. Once you, when I mention heterogeneity, it's simply what you think it is. It's the uh, variation from one spot to another uh, uh, where you have a log fall in the forest. Um, that is a different environment from what's adjacent to it. Um, and then there are, there, there's heterogeneity at different scales uh, at, on whole landscapes uh, or on a small scale in the, in the local stand. Um, and keep in mind too, there's species interactions. We'll talk about these more later. Um, but for example, under these hemlocks, it, 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 it's, it's, it's hard for some herbaceous plants to grow there due to shade and due to soil conditions. But it's also, there could be a player involved, for example, deer could be browsing um, vegetation there as well, accounting for the openness. Um, and so sometimes it's not as simple as one explanation. Well, let's look at how plants interact with other plants. And uh, so we have plant competition, very familiar in our area. We have competition for light. Um, and you see on the left here, fairly, this is a fairly closed forest, but um, the trees, there's sort of a young patch over in there. but. Um, Shade tolerant trees are the only ones that can survive in that, that understory shade. Um, and very often you'll have um, the ability to read the history of a landscape if you see paper birch in a stand, for example. Uh, the age of those paper birch trees gives you a good, good read on when that was a site that was open to very high light and uh, even probably had some bare mineral soil, which is uh, generally required by paper birch to establish. Um, and if you look at other habitats, I thought I'd throw this in. This is kind of an interesting study. This is an aerial view of, excuse me, of the, um, it, it's out in the chaparral in, in California where uh, the, in the surroundings, around these sage clumps, you see bare zones. And so uh, the idea was that there's probably some allelopathy going on. Um, and it's also been discovered and there's, there's a competing hypothesis that maybe herbivory is part of this, that rodents take cover in the sage and they'll come out and graze the, um, the grasses and then uh, seek shelter in the, in the sage. Uh, and both of those factors are involved. What about um, the consumer resource relations with birds? Um, uh, I want to just, we should just make clear, we're talking about food. <laughs> birds are fed by plants, either directly or indirectly. And, but uh, there are some birds that, that do uh, directly consume plant material. Um, and uh, here's, here we have red crossbill eating seeds. Um, and oops, I'm getting trigger happy here. Um, we also have um, mutualisms between birds and plants. And I wanted to con contrast that with um, a situation where a plant is, um, doing the same thing without an animal mutualism. Here we're talking about pollination. So we have a hummingbird uh, collecting nectar from jewelweed and, and 
helping pollinate those flowers. And then on the left, a, a cottonwood that um, is, doesn't have to have big showy flowers because it's using the wind to disperse its, its pollen. And we have uh, similarly, there are wind dispersed plants, as you see on the left, cottonwood, um, but there are mutualisms with birds for dispersal. So they, these mutualisms, we sometimes think of first, especially the, the dispersal, when we, when we think about planting, you know, planting plants for birds, sometimes the thing we think of first would be these um, fruiting species. Um, and the mutualism is such that the bird gets nutrition from that fruity pulp. Um, it's going to excrete a seed that's unharmed and intact um, and be deposited elsewhere. And, and that's accomplishing dispersal for that species. Um, now, I want to mention one other thing. Uh, plants interact with other organisms, and, it, and uh, the example here are mutualisms of birds for defense. And I'm calling this defense because from the plant's perspective, um, it's useful to the plant or to have uh, the birds doing what they're doing, which is eating lots and lots of invertebrates that are feeding on that, that, uh, that plant. Uh, Doug Ptolemy, who I'll be referring to again here in a moment, um, uh, notes that one clutch of young chickadees consumes somewhere between 6,000 and 9,000 caterpillars in the rearing of that clutch. Um, they eat a tremendous number of these little critters. Um, now, that was sort of a whirlwind uh, background in ecology. And, but before we leave the ecology topic, I'm not even done yet. I wanted to have as a last segment, something on stressors. And uh, so be thinking about how each of these might affect the characteristics, uh, the functions of plants, what they're doing in terms of uh, providing vertical structure. Here we have a chalk grassland. This is over in Europe with, with a lawn in the same region. Um, and without that vertical structure, you, you have uh, fewer bird species that are going to be using that environment. Um, you, you, uh, even with the chalk grassland, you have some niche specialization of the birds that use it. Um, and of course, there's a lot more plant diversity there. And then uh, thinking about that last category of plants with um, that are feeding birds by way of insects that eat the plants, there would be um, a lot more services provided in that regard by something like a chalk grassland. But one of our biggest stressors on bird populations is merely habitat loss, the loss of these uh, particular vegetation types. One of the famous studies um, of a transition in a whole landscape in this regard uh, and then dealing also with what we what we now refer to as fragmentation is the Cadiz Township study in Wisconsin, um, where it, in 1831 you had pretty continuous forest, and then by 1978 um, these very small patches or forest islands. And what's interesting, and you can think about this wherever you live, is to think about uh, beyond your borders and what your context is in that landscape is very important. Uh, this is up on the upper left, just a photo I found on the internet of the view from Mount Philo um, to show fragmentation in the Champlain Valley. And, and actually currently the Nature Conservancy is, is interested in one of their initiatives is to restore parts of uh, the original forest to the Champlain Valley because it is so highly fragmented. Um, a really great study that took a lot of, lot of work that was done back in the 90s on oven birds, which you see on the lower left, a bird that um, 
has a lot of convergent evolution, you might say, with thrushes. It feeds on the ground. It likes invertebrates. It builds its nest on the ground with a side entrance like an old-fashioned oven. And uh, one of their findings from this, stu they studied pairing success in these various size patches. So on this x-axis, the log of core area, this is a logarithmic scale. So like 10, 100, 1,000. Um, yeah, I think these are in, uh, uh, yeah, I, might, I think these were hectares. But, um, and what they found was that you know, a pretty good relationship, uh, pretty negative relationship with uh, as these core areas get smaller. In other words, as patches get smaller, the pairing success goes down. Um, you might find a, a male oven bird singing in a small patch on this landscape, uh, but it's not ideal habitat and a female may never never settle down there knowing that it's, it's not a very good habitat. Other, other things they discovered were, were some actual, they found uh, lower invertebrate uh, prey availability in these smaller patches. But let's think about other stressors. We know there can be eutrophication. Um, interestingly, uh, I'll use the chalk grassland again because uh, there's some really good work that was done over many years um, where uh, this number of plant species fell from a little after 1970 to the mid 80s. And at the same time, they were seeing this great increase in a, in a grass um, that was uh, very well adapted to high resource availability. This was getting a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus inputs or nitrogen inputs from the atmosphere um, being surrounded by heavily industrialized areas. And uh, so ironically, as the plants grew better, the stress tolerant tr uh, plants were out competed and so you actually had a drop in numbers of species as you had an increase in the percent cover of one of those species. Um, and so these are just things to keep in mind that can change a forest. They don't affect our uplands in Vermont too much with one important exception. Um, and, and higher elevations, we know uh, this was, uh, studies were bringing this to light in the 80s. We know that acid precipitation, and we're downwind from some pretty heavily industrialized areas in the Midwest, acid precipitation was not only acidifying soil, but increasing uh, nitrogen availability in some of those soils. And some folks are pretty sure that this actually uh, reduced the ability of, of spruce and fir to harden off for the winter uh, and may have led, led to some of the mortality, increased mortality that you see. I'll skip those aquatic systems. Um, climate change is, is imminent in our thinking as well right now. Uh, I, what I have here is the Bicknell's thrush representing um, it, one particular kind of threat if you have uh, birds in these island populations of high elevation spruce fir forest as temperature rises those forests might actually just blip right off the top of the mountain and uh, leaving them with no suitable habitat. So that's an actual serious situation. Whereas down by the coast, if sea level rises and uh, humans, human settlement is not ready to adjust, which is probably a given, uh, it'll, there, there will be more stresses on coastal habitats. Um, I should point out that if, if human population were, was not so um, uh, well established along the coast, these shorelines might be able to adjust up and, uh, and so uh, alleviate some of that problem, but uh, we don't have that luxury right now. Um, Non-native species is huge, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna refer back to this in a moment. Uh, a couple of things I'll mention. Uh, the hemlock woolly adelgid is one that I'm familiar with um, in a sort of a painful way. Uh, 
Uh, I grew up going to the Smokies quite a bit. I've worked in the Smokies, but um, these are dead hemlocks along this valley seam here. And hemlocks in the Smokies, a very moist environment, fairly warm. And there were 400, 500, 600 year old hemlocks that were six feet in diameter, huge, that would die in a, in a few years from this introduced um, non-native species. Um, tremendous effect on structure. And I've mentioned black burning and warblers. Well, it turns out that um, their populations have declined in the Southern Appalachians as you see the decline of hemlocks. Uh, one familiar and, and pernicious in our area, garlic mustard um, affects the understories and tree regeneration we, we find. Uh, sorry for the fuzzy pictures here, but um, it's actually been discovered that, yeah, we, we knew earthworms were non-native, but there are some large earthworms that have more recently been introduced. And where they've gotten established, there's been some studies done showing that these earthworms are speeding the processing of forest litter and uh, affecting things like oven birds. Uh, making making it so that there's less leafy structure there. So these are things that we have to think about. Um, and uh, one other thing, changes to disturbance regime. Uh, one of the famous ones I've, I'll illustrate here is that um, uh, longleaf pine, which depends really, these savannas depend on uh, periodic surface fires, as you see in the lower left. Um, one of their adaptations to that, those surface fires is, is a very thick bark, um, and they have a growth strategy such that the young plant stays with its growing tip buried in the soil as the tree grows for several years before then it bolts to a, to a sizable height. Um, uh, all uh, because that is uh, very adaptive. It helps the plant survive surface fires. If fire is suppressed, um, you get something like this on the lower right. And so, yes, we can change um, an environment dramatically uh, by suppressing something like fire, which in maybe in most people's way of thinking is, is a destructive force, something we ought to prevent. But of course, um, we know it's, it's part of this uh, longleaf pine ecosystem and suppressing it uh, has led to uh, real, a real decline in longleaf pine savanna. All right, so um, this was our sort of major foray through plant ecology. And um, I put here a picture of, uh, a mockingbird because um, we have a we have a winterberry holly not far outside our our kitchen window where uh, a mockingbird of all things came and we were hopeful it would just take up residence all winter one year but it stayed with us about three weeks and I knew that there, there were many, there were there probably weren't enough winterberry hollies to to be good winter habitat and then it moved on but what a joy. I mean, um, so um, let me summarize these bird plant interactions this way. Uh, and, and just simply like this um, think of the plant niche in a bird's life. So, uh, what's, what's it doing for the birds? It is affecting the physical environment, as we saw, um, it's creating habitat. And that habitat is going to create, uh, include places to nest, cover, uh, nesting materials, and it's going to produce food. And some of that is direct, directly consumed food, uh, which we call herbivory, where you're eating the seeds of those trees generally. And some of them are mutualisms, where you might be co-evolved with the plant to help with pollination or fruit dispersal. Uh, uh, plant defense is is less tight co-evolution, but Nonetheless, it's, it's uh, fairly mutualistic because it's benefiting the, the, the birds, that, the, the insects they eat, and it's benefiting the plants. 
uh, by removing the consuming insect. What I'd like to do with um, this, the next topic, and, and these are really brief topics here, um, but, but what an important one. I wanted to pull out an, a specific example of this evolution between birds and plants that does have to do with, with the invertebrates. And some of you may be familiar with Doug Tolmey's book, uh, Bringing Nature Home. Um, about 15 years ago that came out. Uh, he is an entomologist and uh, in studying, he's in Delaware and is in studying uh, the insects in his region, he began to realize pretty quickly that where he could find insects and there were some uh, kinds of plants that he wasn't finding much many insects on and these were the, the non-native plants. And in fact, you, you probably, lots of you, you, you've all seen ads in catalogs uh, advertising plants that are insect free or problem free. Well, it turns out that um, that in itself might be a reason that some non-native plants become invasive. Um, uh, we'll see in a moment some, some figures on well, how, how, how do non-native plants compare to, to native plants in that regard? But um, we've mentioned that caterpillars are the main food for, uh, for many of these insectivorous birds uh, during the nesting season. Some of them switch over to fruits and seeds in the winter. Uh, but Doug Ptolemy was bemoaning the fact he actually came to Green Mountain College and gave a talk. He was bemoaning the fact that there were very few studies to, to really see if, if in fact these lower numbers of, tremendously lower numbers of invertebrates he was finding really make an ecological difference for the birds. And so he collaborated, he finally, he found someone, um, Desiree Narango, who you see pictured on the upper left. Um, took this on as a project with a fairly common bird and uh, recruited lots of homeowners, landowners in a in sort of a diffuse residential area um, where she, she actually recorded um, for, for particular nesting chickadees, she recorded their nesting success and numbers of birds, birds fledged, tremendous amount of work to do this. Um, and then she had to record within its hunting area uh, things having to do with, well, the suite of plants, the plants that, that were available in that area. And you see in the graph in the middle, uh, the x-axis is percent non-native plants. Um, they actually modeled their results, R on the y-axis, it's a population growth factor where uh, population growth of zero is a is a replacement level, uh, but you see that there's even even with small percentages of these non-native plants in their territories, chickadees aren't really doing that well. He, they discovered that below about thirty percent, there's some chance of replacement or even producing young that can disperse to to other sites. Um, but even, even there, uh, not, a, not ideal until you get down below 10% of uh, plants being non-native. Um, if you look at the numbers of fledged and the same axes in non-native plant, percents of non-native plants, the estimated fledged young, this is, this is from a model built from her data, uh, again, you see if you're above about 40% you know, non-native plants in the area, uh, they average one fledged young per clutch. Um, whereas if you're, if you're down to no non-native plants in the area, they're averaging between two and three. Um, and uh, this is, yeah. And then the... Um, 
I, what I'm forgetting is, is how this graph is different. But if, um, if you look at their, the way their model was built, they looked at the uh, different uh, steps in the process toward being fledged and actually uh, took data on each of these steps. Um, now, one of the cool things, and Doug Ptolemy came, I mentioned he came to Green Mountain College. And uh, this really helps in a way uh, with our thinking about plant selection uh, for birds. Um, he's a photographer, as well as someone who does, some, does the science uh, of an entomologist. He, um, I remember him putting up a slide of uh, some of these insect larvae that would appear on black cherry. Here's black cherry uh, depicted here in flower and in fruit. Um, and we know that, uh, gee, there's something like 40 bird species that are known to consume fruits of black cherry. Um, but he started showing slides and of incredibly beautiful uh, and diverse uh, insect larvae and, and, their, and, their, and the structures uh, that they take on. Uh, but instead of just showing two or three, like I'm showing you, he went on to four or five. He showed us a sixth one, a seventh one. And, and then he got up to 10, 12. He kept going, he kept going. And what he was doing was he, he wanted to make and drill in and make the point that ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> this tree hosts an incredible number of species. Uh, he's, he says here, uh, you find that it hosts about 450 insect species. Um, in one of his the interviews, he was said, now, why don't people plant black cherry instead of Zelkova? Zelkova is, is a ornamental that apparently was popular in that area. And he said, I can't find any insects on Zelkova. None, zero. And um, so the, you've got this incredible diversity. Some of these are specific to cherry. Some aren't, like the Eastern tiger swallowtail is not specific to cherry, but some of them are. Um, uh, this cherry gall azure is, is, is specific to uh, uh, at least the cherry group. It's the Prunus genus uh, is, is where you're gonna find uh, these little galls uh, that eventually hatch out oops, into this uh, beautiful little cherry gall azure right here. Um, this last one on the right here, here is the red spotted purple. I accidentally underlined Viceroy, so I've got the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail here, the Cherry Gall Azure here, and the red spotted purple here, which is, is one of the sort of bird dung mimics, if you've heard of such a thing. These are caterpillars that really for all the world look like, uh, yeah, bird dung. Uh, which apparently protects them from detection by at least some bird predators. Um, so if you take these uh, factors that we've been discussing um, and um, you can see where I'm ending up here. I wanna dive into our discussion here in a minute. Um, but I want to talk for, uh, I'll take about five more minutes, I guess, it, to talk about plant selections. So rather than this being a talk where I'm giving you a, a tremendous number of, of uh, interesting plants, my goal has been to, um, to encourage you to think about these sorts of things in making plant selections. First, ecological assessment. Um, think about your site conditions, the landscape context, the species composition, the history of that land, and the stressors. Uh, get familiar with the plants, if possible, the plants and the birds, floras and field guides are going to help there. I mentioned sites here, not because I have time to go into it now, but the Sustainable Sites Initiative, uh, Global Strategy for Plant Conservation, these and other 
There are other things, and and I've put these and others into what it's a it's a shared Google folder that that will be shared with you after the talk. Um, that if you're interested, you can look at. But basically, sites is is was an attempt or is an attempt to do what LEED certification does for buildings. It's like LEED certification is for buildings. It's, it's certification, ecological certification for landscapes. And one of the first things it advises or, or really expects is instead of going in and just wiping the slate clean on your land is that you, you evaluate what's already there the species composition that's already there sometimes is tremendously valuable. Um, things that are already on your land are gonna be very attractive to the birds. Um, and I mentioned the global strategy because it, it sort of incorporates things that, whoops, if I keep um, hitting my trigger, <laughs> yeah, that um, are going to be useful for uh, birds of these particular environments. In Vermont, uh, we have a good guide, excuse me, to uh, plant communities in Vermont, this wetland, woodland, wildland. Um, what I would suggest though, I mean, I, I would strongly advise seeing if you can get somebody to, uh, you might want to, you know, see what their going rate is, but have an ecologist come to your land and do uh, an assessment. I put an example of one that uh, we've done a couple of these uh, that I've done in our area, but you could find somebody in your area that um, could come and spend a couple, of, a couple of hours for a rapid community assessment of your land. Um, you, you know, one thing they might be able to do is tell you, well, what what plant communities would develop here and what species are in those plant communities that, that would do well here and what birds might be associated. Um, so when you're looking for, at species selection in particular, look at your existing plants and then think about the plantings. Um, I wanted to mention just uh, something I wanted to come up with a real example that would illustrate your um, how something as humble as as a goldenrod might in fact be golden. Um, last fall, uh, many of you know, Green Mountain College closed in the spring of 2019, and I was a faculty member there. So last fall, um, I was actually decided to stay with my plan to take a sabbatical. I was working on plant collections and on the data, sitting at a south facing window, it's just a little to the left of, of uh, what you see here, looking out on this view. Um, and over the course of a period of time from September 6th, and I'm looking at my notes, September 6th to, um, oh, let's see. Um, the end of September, September 30th, um, right outside my window in a little patch of common goldenrod with a little tall goldenrod mixed in and a little bit of aster mixed in, two Nashville warblers, a black throated green pair and then another black throated green warbler uh, later on the 14th, chestnut sided warbler on the 8th, chestnut sided warbler on the 12th, Magnolia warbler on the 8th, Philadelphia vireo on the 10th. I don't see many of those at all in the fall. Uh, these were like within six feet of me where I could study them as they were gleaning insects from the goldenrod. Uh, an unidentified bird, which is, was the Dickens, I couldn't, I was, it really seemed like a prairie warbler, but some of the field marks were incorrect. And a Tennessee warbler, on the 12th and on the 30th. This was a total of seven, six or seven different warbler species that came to um, the goldenrod outside the window. These are not my pictures, but just to illustrate, this, these are the kinds of birds I was seeing, the Nashville warbler. 
here's your black threaded green and the chestnut sided warbler. These are fall. And I managed to find some photos with them with, with goldenrod. The fall magnolia, sometimes the side streaks are not very obvious. Here's that Philadelphia vireo. Um, notice the, the yellowish undertail coverts. They don't, uh, it, a Tennessee warbler might look similar, but doesn't have that. Here's your prairie warbler, although I wasn't sure about that one. A Tennessee warbler, see those white undertail coverts. These are the what you what these birds look like in the spring. Uh, some of our most <laughs> colorful, glorious, spectacular warblers. And I was sitting at my kitchen table looking out and going, oh my goodness. Uh, this is an illustration of uh, how it, it, this ecosystem service was dramatic, uh, providing so much um, uh, you know, food for these birds. By the way, those were males. These are males. And I thought, well, that's no fair. I shouldn't show females. Same species. These are in the spring. Uh, females. Uh, that of, of all of those that you saw, magnolia, black or green, Nashville chestnut sided, and uh, Philadelphia vireo in the middle. And on the right, you have the Tennessee warbler and prairie warbler. Um, in closing, um, think about plants that um, are going to function in, in your system. And it turns out that native plants are going to be uh, the best choice because of, of their ability to uh, provide food for so many invertebrates, invertebrates being what even seed eaters depend on to feed their young. And if you're looking for an explanation of this phenomenon, um, think about millennia, not just millennia, but millions of years of coevolution. Uh, plants defend themselves with chemi chemicals. And um, let's go back to some goldenrod here. If you, uh, but if you think about uh, the goldenrod that's grown here uh, with insects that are evolving to consume that, those species, um, we have a coevolution going on. It's been called an arms race at times, but there are insects that can detoxify those chemicals or handle them. Um, and they, they may need maintain a kind of balance. And so in fact, goldenrod, when it's introduced in other continents uh, is often invasive. Uh, goldenrod here, although some people will say it's invasive, it's, it's a very well behaved, just an old field, successful old field weed. Um, so, um, it, and you'll, you'll find a lot of pleasure, of course, in um, planting some of these species that these birds have co-evolved with over millennia. Here's back to our black cherry. Um, and um, it, to close. So I realize that um, it, I've only sort of maybe piqued your interest in th thinking of, about some of these drivers for plant bird interactions rather than giving you a talk about particular species. Um, I have included in the list of shared documents a list of the woody na native woody species of Vermont. You'll see that in there. And um, you'll see a really interesting um, uh, PDF uh, on silviculture for the birds, which is really useful for those of you who have some, some land uh, besides what's, what's a very heavily designed landscape right around your house. Uh, it has suggestions on things like maintaining snags and maintaining the support structure and so on. So you see lots of other things there. Um, and there, we, there's also going to be a list with some links to uh, sources of plants and um, sources of information that will give you great pleasure to look at. Uh, uh, sources like conservation gardens, like the uh, Garden in the Woods of, of the Native Plant Trust in North Carolina Botanical Garden and Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. 
in Texas, things like that. Um, now, let me, I'm, I'm done and I think I'm over, over what I hope to be at, but I think we have over 20 minutes here if we wanna have Q&A and discussion. Um, let's see, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. How's that? I don't see any questions in the chat box. If anyone has a question, you can either okay. type it in and I can read it out for you or just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask Jim yourself. Here we are. And it doesn't have to be a question. It could be um, a comment or maybe something you've observed. So, uh, Jim, I would ask you this question. So, um, <clears throat> one of the, um, I do a lot of silviculture on my property, and uh, I've been uh, favoring maples over ash, as you can imagine. And, right. And, but I'm wondering in terms of black cherry versus uh, red maple or sugar maple. Um, if you were to pick one of those two, I have certainly way more maple and cherry. Um, right. Of those two, which one would you think would be the better to favor? Yeah, I, you know, my hunch would be to go on the, the characteristics of the site. Between the sugar maple and red maple, the sugar maple is going to like your, you probably know this, it likes the slightly richer soils. Then red maple, you're going to find more red maple on sites that uh, are a little more acidic, a little more calcium, less less calcium rich. Um, but both the maples and the and the um, the prunus genus are going to be good uh, good supporters of of uh, invertebrates. So I wouldn't have any recommendations on those based on that. Okay. Um, when, you know, it seems like around here, is this the case around you that you have, black cherry is a pretty common tree, the maples are pretty common, you're going to, you're going to often find both in the same woods. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and so, um, there is some, uh, I mean, it is attractive to, uh, maintain the, the diversity of that forest. And uh, one of the things we do sacrifice sometimes, like when we create a, a sugar bush, we, we may be reducing that overall diversity. On a landscape scale, that may not be a problem whatsoever because somebody may have a sugar bush that's dominated by sugar maples. Uh, but if, if you look at the whole region, there are areas with substantial portions of these other other species um so i don't even worry about that on a small scale okay All right, we have a few few qu other questions coming in first one from donna which is we have approximately three to four acres of meadow that is increasingly taken over by buckthorn please comment yay <laughs> oh dear um yeah um is this common buckthorn do you know or, or glossy buckthorn? Unknown. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, either way, um, when I was at Green Mountain College in the in the sort of 2004-2005 range, um, uh, what was his name? Chris Matlock, I think, is his name, who works for the Forest Service now in Vermont. Anyway, he was with the New England Wildflower Society. He came to give a talk. He walked our land with us and people, the students like to say, wow, did you see his reaction when he saw the glossy buckthorn? He, he nearly fainted. He, he, he said, get that plant out of here. So um, th here's the good news. I think with three or four acres, you, you can manually control it as surprising as that might sound. Um, and, We've done that on our land on seven acres pretty easily without too much work. It's the it's the it's the gout weed that's causing us the greatest problem. But I would pull it, and if it's too big to pull, 
uh, you can do one of two things. If you know somebody who does a lot of conservation work, who works with invasives, borrow a weed wrench, which is this device that basically levers plants out of the ground. It grabs them um, and has a fulcrum down right on the ground and you're pulling it back um, and uprooting the plant that way. And then if it's too big for that, you might just cut those bigger stems. Um, if, you, if, if you want, you could use glyphosate to paint on the cut stem. And um, there's a lot of evidence that just that kind of targeted use of glyphosate is nothing in the world like the abuse of glyphosate that you see um, in agricultural settings. So um, I don't. I wouldn't just categorically uh, avoid it if you if you are right rightfully concerned about it, which I would be too. But you can. It's it's called the cut cut and paint method, where you just take a little brush and you paint that that glyphosate around the cambium layer of that cut stem uh, to get rid of it. Do you have any uh, suggestions for non glyphosate options? Yeah, I mean, my my main one is, and we've done this almost. We haven't had to use any chemicals on shrubs in our in our woods, and it's it's back to the pulling method. So, and then if you cut it, um, you can then you know go back the next year and cut it again. In other words, you could cut it at two feet height, and then go back the next year and cut it at one foot, and that plant will be su substantially weakened. So. Uh, yeah. The other thing is, I've heard of a neighbor getting rid of um, multi-floor rows with their tractor and a chain. <laughs> you wrap it around there and you pull those, <laughs> pull them out. So I was just pulling that out of my garden. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Donna, for the question. Um, next question is, why is there no botanic garden in Vermont? You are. That is a wonderful question. <laughs> You know, when I put together, you'll see this list of plant sources. And this is um, related to that as well. There are lots of little nurseries, and my hat's off to the hard work they do, but a lot of the nurseries are dealing with ornamentals in a traditional way. There's a lot of, of non-natives that are being sold and, you know, they try to avoid the invasive ones, but, um, we don't have too many good suppliers of native plants, the exception being the ones that grow for restoration, and thank goodness for those. We have one near us, the uh, Champlain Valley Native Plant Rest uh, Restoration Nursery, uh, things like that. It's not a botanical garden. I think whoever asked the question, you should start <laughs> a, a native plant. It should be a native plant garden. Um, we don't have one in the state. And uh, it, it could be such a, an interesting and educational place. I remember when I was really into birds and I, I flew in, I went by myself, this was back in the 1980s, to Newfoundland, landed in St. John, Newfoundland, and discovered a botanical garden at the university, which had a bunch, it was this huge area of just native plants labeled and before I headed out into the wilderness of Newfoundland, I went to that and I was like in, in heaven. I was just like, whoa, these are all labeled and I can learn these plants so easily. So um, go for it. <clears throat> I do not know the answer. I do not know why, <laughs> why there isn't one. Um, Rachel is asking, I'm wondering what resources you might suggest for a small yard in town? I have let as much goldenrod grow as possible and I'm trying to get milkweed started as well in a strip of unmowed grass. I also have leaf litter on site. Anything else? I, I applaud that. I, we went to see a site near us where the family was uh, tending milkweed and they had monarch butterfly uh, larvae on there. It was, it was great and it didn't take a very big yard. Um, I think the, I would look at your surroundings um, for what's in that area. And this is where the, it'd be nice to have a, somebody who grows these plants. But um, that, that would be my take is, I, I'll give you one image for this. Um, 
this was this was very this had a big, big impact on me when I was like probably mid teens. Uh, I remember going to the Smokies and coming on the Walker Sisters Cabin, which is this cabin lived in by these uh, sisters who lived together, and they were grandfathered in to to live in the park out the, the rest of their days from the 1930s all the way up into the 60s. They had brought plants from their surroundings to their yard. Um, and what, it was beautiful, monk's hood and bee balm and things like that. Um, resources, I think, what I'll, I'll think about this question as I, as I look at the resources I've shared, I would go in there. When you, when you look at some of these botanical gardens, they do have cool examples of yards with designs. Like one that's not close to here, but I'm just thinking of it right now is that the Santa Barbara Botanical Garden. I know that's not us, but but they you can look at this little cottage with all the plantings around it, and it's all native, and it and it gives you some really great ideas. So that that might be a good way to get ideas as to what you can do. But resource-wise, yeah, go for um, find out as much as you can about plants in your own area. Maybe try propagating some. Thanks. Um, and Rachel, I'd love to come over and take a look and give you some suggestions if you want. Um, Good idea. <laughs> Jonathan, Jonathan asks, can you speak about deer impacts on native versus non-natives and thus the impact of survival of natives as food for invertebrates? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we've been seeing some herbivory on, on uh, garlic mustard which we think is deer, um, but uh, it is true that um, deer, deer are more generalists than many of these insects. So there is a chance that they can, can consume some non-natives, but, but it's also true that we have some real bad examples of invasive shrubs that are not Eaten by deer. It was a great example would be barberry, you know, where you have a woods that's heavily grazed or even moderately grazed. Um, uh, that's what you'll find is that the barberry thrives. Um, so I do think you still yeah, have, a, have a similar problem. Um, one of the stressors I didn't talk too much about was the. Um, uh, trophic imbalances, um, where where you have, let's say you you lose a predator, deer increase. Uh, there's been some really neat exclosure studies that have shown uh, a real decline in trilliums and some of the other spring wildflowers because of deer browse. Um, and it is it is true that some of the non-natives aren't are not as eaten as effectively. I don't have as much knowledge about particular species, except except that I know that we don't we don't see control of these non-natives either by insects or deer enough to prevent their fast increase, um, and so that's cir circumstantial evidence that the deer are not browsing back, say, buckthorn or honeysuckles or um, multiflora rose or barberries uh, very, very effectively. Do you think that, it, yeah, that's not a good answer, but that's, that's my attempt. Um, uh, what, from what, what we do know is that um, we, we have some herbivory of those non-natives, but not enough to keep them in check. I can I can tell you on my property that is exactly the case. <laughs> okay. So you see a little bit of herbivory, but not enough to control. Yeah. No, I don't see basically any, um, especially buckthorn. Yeah. It's yes. it's it's just right. I put a lot of work into yeah. getting rid of buckthorn, and it just sprung up, and it's not being browsed. Yeah. Uh, nor the others. Right. Right. And, uh, and are you near Randolph? I am in Randolph. I have a 17 acre parcel surrounded yeah, by yeah, yeah. Two acres, so. 
Right. And I'm a pretty active manager of the property, so. Right, right. Yeah, I, I, I think, I think it's, it's difficult once it gets thoroughly established, but um, if you, um, I got a student from Green Mountain College to come help me remove all my honeysuckle ones. Now, honeysuckle is a lot easier than buckthorn. Um, and the guy weighed 230 pounds, and we would sometimes both lean on the weed wrench, and we popped those things right out of the ground. <laughs> so maybe my recommendation is uh, hire a high school student who's probably wanting work this summer if you can, I don't know if you can socially distance on a weed wrench though. But anyway, <laughs> um, oh, I, I'm, well, I, I got I a have tractor. My these. Yeah, I got a tractor and everything, but uh, yeah, uh, it's tough, you know, because it just had one, one stand of ash, almost pure ash. And all of a sudden I had, I had cut all the big buckthorn on my property, hundreds of stems. And then years ago suddenly this buckthorn just came into this ash stand and oh boy i could spend the rest of my life pulling the seedlings out you know it's just uh, right right you know, unfortunate but i yeah I, uh, uh, you know, your point about roundup is is a good one you know that um yeah you know you you use it judiciously and it it can have an effect at least of knocking especially the bigger uh specimens back um right right you know because i do the same thing i chop it chop it chop it and, but yeah it's tough it's tough yeah yeah i i wish you, i wish you well is it is there a lot of buckthorn surrounding your property um there is some um, my what i can gather from what i see of the based on the history of the property as i've kind of looked at it <clears throat> is someone obviously brought some buckthorn in as a hedge and you know the rest is history but you know it's it's uh, i have chir the chervil is just taken over um which is a whole other right. issue but um yeah, but it's it's really tough to take to take care of uh, these invasive at scale. You know? My 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 internet connection is unstable for some reason, but uh, can you still hear me? Yep. Can you still hear me? I can. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> can't okay. hear you. It's just a yep. little delayed. Yes. Yeah. Well, we're coming up almost on eight o'clock. Yeah, anyone getting... have any final questions for Jim? Anything, anything else to wrap up? Or are we starting to, to lose everyone's connection? I just want to say I'm going to email everybody <laughs> yeah, the list are. of links to Jim's resources that he sent us. Right, and I will, um, I will put the. Uh, I haven't put the slideshow in there, but I will do that. Right. Thank you, everyone. Great, and I just wanted to thank you very much, Jim for being willing to work with us in this in this new format and everybody else for trying it out with us and thank you emily for helping yeah i, I had deal a lot with of fun. the, the q a and everything else and orca media for maybe recording it <laughs> it was great fun thank, thank you. you thank you thank you very much it was great enjoyed it Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jasmine. I'll um, I'll be in touch by email, and uh, I'll I'll put the show up right now into that uh, shared folder. Bye, everybody. Sounds perfect. We'll let you know if we have a good recording that we're going to put up somewhere. Thank you. Great. Thank, Thank you, you, Jim. Yeah, I know a couple of people who'd be interested in that. All right.
Thank okay, you. Okay, great. Yeah, we'll send we'll send the links around bye afterwards. Bye. Sounds wonderful. Everybody laugh. Thank you so much. Bye.